It is time for the burning platform. This is what we do on a Thursday morning. Get ourselves up to date with the most important things that are happening in our world. Also talk to people from all over the world who have interesting insights and have analyzed our situation and have come up with some interesting ideas, solutions, and perhaps just ways for us to understand and make sense of all the craziness that's happening in the world. So today, I'm really happy to have um, Pumi Mashiko with me, who is always here on a Thursday, and she uh, she brings wisdom and balance to other, you know, my my tirades and uh, my my irritation with whatever's going on in the news. But this morning, also, we have uh, Rob Hersov on, and I'm so happy he could join us uh, just a few days after he made yet another firebrand speech at the uh, Biz News Conference. This seems to be a thing that um, Rob is one of the few people in business in South Africa who has the balls to do, because we have said on the show, Pumi, how many times have we said, business is in <laughs> cahoots with government. In so many ways, business is in bed with government. They enable government to misbehave and to steal and to pilfer and to pillage the way that they do. And very few people in business have actually stood up and said, Actually, you guys need to account for yourselves. One of the few people who's done that is Rob Hersov. He made this uh, speech, it's gone viral. It was passed around on WhatsApp like a hot coal from person to person. Uh, people who I didn't even think had an interest in politics or the economy or anything else were sending me this video. And um, and <laughs> it's not long. It's it's a you know it's a couple of minutes, and in it. Rob covers a huge amount of ground, and I think he speaks for a huge number of South Africans who are just fed up. Um, you know, whether you're politically um, on the same side as Rob or not, whether you're um, in the position that he's in, it doesn't matter. I think there's a lot there that has resonated with people, and that's why it's gone viral. You know, we can always look at these things and go, oh, well, like Adrian Basson from News 24 is like, why is this stuff going viral? I'm not. Where? I'm meant to be the media guy. But you only go viral if you're saying things that are true and that resonate with people. And I think the last time Adrian Basson did that was probably 1997 or somewhere. So I'm glad that we've got Rob on this morning. And uh, I know you've got lots of questions for him. I know we've got lots to unpack here. So Rob Hersov, how nice of you to join us all the way from Singapore. Good to see you. Thank you, Gareth. It's lovely to yeah. be here. How can I miss this opportunity to be on the Gareth Clip Show? <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you seem to, um, to, to choose opportunities sometimes which get you into huge trouble, Rob. You've gone, again, out of the frying pan into the fire. You were just starting to, um, to melt back into the, uh, the business world and to do the right thing and kind of get all your stuff up and running and do the deals that you have to do to make stuff happen. And then you had to go and bloody open your mouth again, you fool. Why? Oh, I don't know. I, I don't feel like I'm doing anything that special. I mean, I just, I'm just telling it like it is. There was a movie in the 80s or, or 90s, which was, uh, you know, where this guy hung out of the window of his apartment in New York and was shouting, enough is enough. And I just feel like I'm that guy, but I shouldn't be the only one. I think a, a big, vast majority of the people in this country are feeling the same thing. And even though I've just said, you know, Cyril, you're, you're to blame, you're responsible, and he is. Um, you know, and the ANC cabinet who are absolutely useless, name by name, we should go through them. I mean, they're just mm. idiots. It yeah. shouldn't just be me because if I didn't talk about the ANC and didn't talk about Cyril and I said, enough is enough. We've had enough of load shedding. We've had enough of sewage being mm. pumped into the ocean. We've had enough of potholes. You know, we've had enough of waiting forever to get a visa that we are legitimately allowed to get. We've had enough of... And I can go on and on and on and on. Enough of, you know, state-owned enterprises being bankrupted. You know, yeah. we're enough of mafias getting in the way of efficiency in the state. If I presented it that way, you know, you'd have 95% of the population saying, I agree. But the next step is clearly why. And the reason why is because the majority voted in the ANC government and they've delivered us these idiots in the cabinet who have no interest in the country as a whole. So why do you think when you open your mouth, it creates such a disturbance? And why do you think that it goes viral? I mentioned earlier that I think it resonates with lots of people because you're also one of those people who understands what it's like on the inside of business. You know a lot of the people involved here. You've met, you've sat in rooms with senior politicians. You've sat in rooms with senior business people. 
you know what the corporate elite of South Africa look like. Um, so, so why is it that you seem to have the impact that you have when people in the media who are writing editorials all the time don't seem to create anything more than a tiny little ripple and you create this huge big splash? Why do you think that is? So someone I admire enormously and a friend of mine, and I was at university with him, Mark Barnes, someone I really respect, wrote an article a few days ago. And I actually should have it. I should type it in and read you the first two lines. Can I just ask, is Mark Barnes not the guy who is supposed to fix the post office? I'm, I'm just well, saying. He That's went in there. Hmm. He went in there and he said, I won't take a salary. I just want to be called Postmaster General and I will fix the post office. I mean, he Did gave, you know, he couldn't do it. He, he said the cadres, I call them cadres, not cadres, but the cadres mm. within the post office just resisted basically everything he tried to do. He put his career on the line. He, put, you know, he didn't take any money and he committed himself to fixing the post office. He said it was an impossible task because one level down, people would nod their heads, say they're going to do the job, not do the job. They'd fake invoices. They'd you know, restate affidavits. It's just the corruption that's been inserted into our economy and our lives by the ANC makes it impossible to fix. I interrupted you. You were saying about Mark before I interrupted you about the post he's office. A great, he's a great guy. He's a fantastic guy. But he wrote this article a few days ago. And, you know, it's similar, similar to the one that, that ANC ass kisser Colin Coleman, you know, wrote a few months ago. And just read the first two lines. Dear Mr. President. Mm. I mean, even just saying that. It's just so pathetic. I mean, how can you say, dear Mr. President, he is, Cyril Ramaphosa is the problem. I call him Cyril because that's about the most respect I can give to the guy. But, you know, these articles, open letters to the dear Mr. President, we have a socioeconomic crisis in hand. I mean, they're not going <laughs> to read those emails. You've got to no. tell it like it is, and you've got to have a bit of anger and a bit of soul in what you say. None of these guys are doing that. All right, so Pumi, I mean, you watched the the clip too, and I'm sure there was a lot of stuff in there that is kind of obvious because we've spoken about it here on the Burning Platform before, but there's a lot of stuff that Rob is going out on a limb for, um, and you've paid the price for some of this before, Rob. Um, Pumi, do you have do you have any any questions around why it is that poor old Rob Hersov seems to attract as much attention as, as he does, as opposed to everyone else. Or is it, is it not poor old Rob? I don't Rob think we can ever likes... use the term. I don't <laughs> think we can ever use the term poor next to old, maybe, but poor next to Rob, I'm not sure. But I have, I, you know, and I did watch the, the and watch the whole 23 minutes of it, which I think a lot of people did not. So a lot of, of what we saw kind of uh, flitting around is I don't think a lot of people watched the whole thing. And I, I have a, a clarifying question that I, I need to, to understand, you know, because when you started the conversation, you started by saying that you, you with your family's money, gave Cyril the opportunity to step up. That's and and what what I what I'm really interested to know is what that means. You know yeah, what what is the, that was the incorrect. To step up. What does that mean? That was incorrect. We didn't actually give him the money to step up. We Anglo Val took him seriously as head of the National Unit Workers of Mine Workers Union. Mm -hmm. You know, they showed him the respect in his position to meet with him and listen to him and you know understand what his and the mine workers' needs were. You know, we, we never gave him actual money. We never paid him anything. We never donated anything. I, I gave quarter of a million rand to his, this, his school's project, um, his school's charity. I never even got a thank you email, you know. Thanks, Cyril. Um, anyway, I did some good for the country there. Um, we didn't actually give money. We didn't actually actively help Cyril step up, but we gave him the respect he deserved all the way along the line. But he's not getting it anymore because he doesn't deserve any respect. He deserves endless criticism and to be kicked out. That's what he really deserves. I mean, well, because it, what it sounded like, the framing of what you said is it sounded like, and we will never know who else were the donators in terms of allowing Cyril to ascend to become the president of the ANC and thereby the president of the country. But that's what it sounded like you were saying. 
Yeah, and that's incorrect. Never, never happens. When the when Zuma was removed and Cyril was brought in, and they had that elective conference, um, you know, I think Cyril actually lost that vote. Mrs. and Courses under Luminia Zuma won, and the only reason Cyril actually managed at the very last minute to persuade that gangster David Mabuza to vote for him was because he paid him. And certain big business people, I'm sure, I, I would assume most of them white, gave that money at the very last minute. I reckon Cyril got on the phone to yeah. a couple of people and said, I need 30 million rand to bribe the guy to vote for me. Uh, that's what I think happened, uh, hypothetically. But I'm, I'm pretty much pretty sure I'm right. And I'm pretty sure I know who gave the money. But I'm not going to say. I've lost enough friends as it is. Um, sure. You know, there's no question... <laughs> They gave the money. Why do you think they gave him the money? Because the because the ANC pretend there's a good ANC and a bad ANC, and the good ANC, which is supposedly Cyril, which is we now know is complete nonsense, you know, would call people and say, "We're going to try and keep these RET monsters out," but to do so, you've got to give us money to make sure it doesn't happen. Make sure these guys don't come in. Behind us are these monsters, you know, David Mabuza. Um, Tony Yengeni, uh, Lindiwe Sazulu, uh, Mrs. Nkosazana Lemini, these monsters, they're going to destroy the country. But if you help us with financially, we'll keep them away. Well, that, guys, is blown because we know there is no good ANC. They're all a bunch of monsters. You know, Cyril's done yeah. nothing, nothing yeah, look, in his I mean, time and power. Just so you know, because um, while Pumi and, and I were watching your, your video and she knows you, you don't know. Pumi's been... Like, not the biggest fan of Cyril from day one, and she warned us about this. Um, kind of, you know, I was one of those people. I've made some terrible decisions in, in my life, and I've said some things that I wish I hadn't said. Uh, among them was back in Polokwane all those years ago when Jacob Zuma unseated Tabo Mbeki. You know, God, what I would do for Tabo Mbeki now. I'm sure you'd feel the same way, Rob. But yeah. But Pumi warned me. She said to me when, you know, everybody was getting ready. I didn't ever get enthusiastic about Cyril. I just thought he was really the best of a bunch of really terrible options. But Pumi said to me, don't underestimate this man's inability to do anything properly. And you were right then, Pums. So we should have listened to you from the very beginning. But Rob, the, this thing about business and, and the money, the money that powers the ANC, we've got to get to those people. Now, it's all good and well that you're up there and you're brave enough and you say what you say. And, and people in the, in the comments, by the way, are all saying, thank you so much, Rob. You look like Robert Redford. <laughs> Only um, when I'm tired. Please bring us some electricity back from uh, Singapore. Uh, respect to you for saying it loudly and saying how it is. Rob is no coward. You know, people are saying all this stuff. And I know that that, that kind of helps, especially when you are. Uh, dealing with people who, who are no longer your friends. But what is it with the rest of these craven uh, people in business who are doing the wrong thing, who are giving the ANC or people in the ANC the money to be able to keep perpetuating these nefarious networks of patronage? Do they not have a conscience about what they're doing or are they happy to take the money and run when it comes back from the other side? I'll give you two sides to the story. There's no question, Patrice Motsepi, gives money and a lot to the ANC. But he also gives to Action SA and DA. Mm -hmm. Okay, now... Covering his... He's hedging his bets, right? Hedging his bets. And I'm no doubt, in my mind, Adrian Gore does the same thing. You know, he's a sort of classic old lefty. Mm -hmm. But they're doing, they're doing no good for the country whatsoever, okay, by hedging their bets. I mean, if, if, in fact, that's just collusion. You know, Adrian wants to win the NHI account, Bankrupt the country, mm -hmm. but discovery will do very well. I mean, that's that's just, in my view, I mean, he's not evil, but he's very wrong. Adrian Gore's very wrong. Patrice Motsepi is very wrong. What they're doing is very wrong. But what's equally wrong are people who don't give any money at all to any of the political parties. Oh, uh, you know, the, we're not in politics. Business and politics must stay separate. Well, that's bullshit. I'm sorry because, you know. Patience is one thing, but you take patience for too long and it is cowardice. So we don't have a Harry Oppenheimer of this generation. Harry Oppenheimer stood up and berated the Nats, attacked the Nats, and publicly said, I'm funding the opposition and I'm standing behind the opposition. Mm -hmm. There are people that stand up and berate the ANC, 
but they don't go one step further and say, and I'm backing well, out and saying, the, uh, I just want to say that that's quite a novel thing too. Only in the last 10 to 12 years have people had the, suddenly developed the balls and the spine to be able to criticize the ANC. And there's still people, especially in the media, who are loath to do it because they think it makes them uncool and it puts them in danger. And it, of course it does make, make them uncool. It, besides that, but you, what you forget is that what business is, in, what business is in the business of doing is creating shareholder value, right? So it makes no sense for them to alienate one of the biggest spenders in our community, in our economy, right? It makes no sense for them to to alienate no, that. No, I disagree. And that's that's okay. <clears throat> It, but I, I think that one of the things that we know for sure, and we've spoken about this, and I, I've told you guys about it, Gareth, about who pays for what and why the status quo remains, because we were just talking about it in the past hour. Just look at the sense announcements of many of the businesses on our stock exchange in the past two weeks, and you will see that they are making super profits. The chaos works for them. Right, the chaos works for them, and that's why they are happy to fund the ANC, the DA, the EFF, and Action SA because it works. Let me give you one more element here. So, before my speech, I was thinking, should I name names, lose more friends? Should I name names, lose? You know, I've lost millions of dollars. I'm, I'm that's a story I can't tell yet, but I'm going to tell in about six months' time when something's Good. out of the way. But there Good. are instances institutions that have stabbed me in the back heavily. And I'm going to name them, but give me to the end of the year. We need these There's people. There's one thing you need to know. I called the CEO of one of our largest financial institutions in the country. And I, I won't name his name because I promised I wouldn't. And I said, help me here. Why, why is business not standing up? Why is the silence of the lambs? As the country nosedives, business is silent. And he said, Rob, we're not silent. We have these councils and these private meetings with Cyril and blah, 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 where we're tough on him. And we're, and I said, yeah, but that doesn't help. The man in the street doesn't know about it. I don't even know about it. And right. he sent me these position papers that the, I don't, I've forgotten the name, B, BLSA or something like that, produces. And they're very hard hitting, excellent position papers. I didn't even know they existed. Nor does the man in the street know, or woman in the street know they exist. Right. So it doesn't look like business is doing anything. Yeah. And then I had a careful look at the board of directors of some of the main companies in South Africa. Okay. It's worth doing. And let's just take Standard Bank as an example. Mm -hmm. On the board of Standard Bank is a lady called Geraldine Fraser Molochetti. Mm -hmm. On the board. She was a senior member of government in a department that approved cadre deployment. Right. From 2005 to 2009. Go and have a look. And she sits on the board of Standard Bank. Now, there is someone that actively destroyed our country sitting on the board of one of our biggest financial institutions. It's disgusting. Yeah. And if you go company by company, you'll see these caters, colluders, communists. I mean, how can a person be a communist in this day and age? It's moronic. Quere. You listening to me? Yeah, 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 of course. It's moronic. And these people sit on the boards of these companies. So for a CEO that relies on their salary and their options to feed their family and be successful, they've got sitting on their board these monsters who come from the ANC, are appointed by the Communist Party or whomever, and they're sitting there on the board. So it's very hard for these CEOs to stand up and take a stance. Now, Sim Shabalala did attack the... Um, gray listing, whatever it is, and say to the government, this can't happen. But that's very much in their sector. Hmm. They need to go broader and they need to more broader attack the government on their terrible policies and not just within their own narrow sectors. They've got to stand up. Neil Froneman stands up. He's the one guy I can really point yeah, to. He's, he's and Michelle LaRue, Capitec. Well done them. And Johan Rupert did as well. But then, you know, he got hammered in that one ambush of an interview and he has been very quiet since then yeah, and who could blame who could blame these people if they've got more to lose than to gain why should they take it on the chin every time i mean ordinary south africans are taking it on the chin every day and and pumi and i talk about this when it comes to you know the petrol price when it comes to inflation when it comes to the fact that anyone who saved any money in south africa in the last 20 years has got less now than they had when they started saving and 
this is not an acceptable circumstance for anyone to find themselves in, especially for doing the right thing. And it does feel sometimes, Rob and Pumi, like the ordinary man is just being attacked on all sides. You know, we see these huge profits that these companies make and we think, well, hang on, that's our money. And we see the, the money that government pays to whoever and steals from whoever. And we know that that's our money too. You know, I, 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 got, attacked, I got attacked by a really nasty ad hominem attack on News24 <coughs> by some unemployed old Hilton old boy I'm not going to mention his name. And it was a nasty, like, personal attack. You probably may have read it. And I got the right to respond, and I did. But I called my cousin, husband, knows this unemployed surfer, and called him and said, what the hell are you doing? Rob's trying to do the right thing for the country. Why do you do this nasty ad hominem attack on him? And the guy said, News 24 encouraged me to do it. Right. Yeah. Now, so what is that all about? What is so that all about? Although, guys, we, we're we still, you know, imperfect as it is, still live in a constitutional democracy. What then is democracy, right? Democracy says that each and every individual has a right to make their decision about who they support with their vote mm -hmm. and who they support with their money. So we may not like it. And as Churchill reminded us all those many years ago, that's the thing about democracy. It's imperfect. <laughs> You know, it's a terrible system of government, but yeah, still better but than then, every other then, one tried. So where, where then, you know, where, where then do we draw well, the line and say we're never, we're, we, okay, so then the democracy doesn't work. People mustn't well, make the decisions that and, they and make. Pums, I, what's ringing in my ears is always that line of you get the government you deserve. Is this not the government that South Africa deserves? What kind of people are we? You know, we think we, in our, in our ideal um, utopian idea of what South Africa should be. We, I don't know what kind of a country we see, and maybe we don't all see the same kind of country, but South Africans are a messy, undisciplined, lazy bunch, generally, which is why people from any other country in Africa come here and work and work and will find work, first of all, and will create work for themselves. And we look at ourselves, and I, I look at South Africans in our little gated communities or in our townships or wherever, as long as we're okay here, we don't give a shit about what's happening out there. And then we complain about the ANC, but we vote for them or the DA or the EFF or whoever, and it doesn't seem to make a huge difference. I mean, apart from the obvious difference that's happening in the Western Cape. And that's something that I want to have your opinion on, Rob, because the Western Cape is one of those places that you believe in. You're, you're building, you're, you're putting infrastructure into place there at the moment. An American, an American friend uh, who'd been South Africa only once came a second time and flew down just to see me and spent two days in the Cape. And he went, it's unbelievable. It's palpable, the difference mm. of coming from up country down to the Cape. What's that all about? And I said, it's very simply, the DA is the difference. The DA runs the Western Cape, and they run it well, and they, and they run it for the good of the people. The ANC just break and steal. And that's now obvious on the ground. But what's more important is Franz Cronier of his Strategic Research Foundation mm. is doing deep dive polls amongst South Africans and his deepest ones in Ward 54 in Soweto amongst ANC voters and people who didn't vote. Mm -hmm. What they're discovering, the majority of people know the DA can run a city, a municipality, a province and a country better than the ANC. They all know that. Everybody knows it. The man on the woman on the street knows it. That, that they know that if the DA came to power, South Africa would be a better run country. Okay, this is the majority. I, I don't know if, if they know. So why then? I don't know if they know that the DA would run a better country. Because if you live in the Western Cape and you live in Inyanga, if you live in Kukuletu, you know that even though you are living in a Western Cape that is run by the DA, your quality of life is not the same as in the city. You know that. Why are they failing to get those people to vote for them? Yeah, but you, but you're going to compare. Those, I'll you tell you why. Apples and apples. I mean, if you're in a township yeah. in Johannesburg and you're in a township in the Western Cape, then you're comparing apples with apples. But if you're because comparing living in Nyanga to living in Constantia, obviously you, you, that's apples. And no, no, no. The polls go deeper than that. The polls go deeper than that. Those people were then asked, 
how would you feel about the DA running the country? And they feel like they may lose a lot of their current privileges. They may be marginalized, but the marginalization they would have under the DA would still be a better result than what they're getting from the ANC today. So what we need to do over the next 18 months, because the election is going to be in May 2024, you heard it here first, what we need to do between now and then is persuade the 55% of people who didn't vote at all to vote and to vote for change. So I'm not prescribing vote for the DA, Action SA, PA, Encarta. I'm saying you've got to vote for change. Let's get the ANC out and vote for change. That's the I lesson. want to know why the I want to know why opposition parties are incapable of getting people to vote for them. So I want to know why it is if people know the DA is better, why would they rather stay home and not vote for the DA? And why is the DA incapable oh getting people to come and vote for them. I would like to know why it is that the EFF is unable to get people to vote for them. It is mm. their failing too. Not only is it an ANC failing, it is their failing too. They are unable to convince the voting public that they should be voted for. Pumi, very good point. The reason people aren't actually going to vote for the EFF in droves is because the majority of South Africans know that they are racist, destructive, nasty, and evil. They have a, they have a ceiling of about 12% of the population. They're never going to go beyond that. Forget the EFF. The ANC is going to break in half because there is no one voice for the ANC. There are communists. There are capitalists. There are crooks. There are half-decent people. But the polls are slumping massively. If there was an election held today, today only in the urban areas... France Cronier's polls say the ANC would be 30% or less. They've lost the urban areas, okay? So the next step to answer your question is how do we get people to vote for the DA Action SA? It's happening as but, we but, but Rob, Pumi's right, though, that they, these guys should be, I mean, they should be capitalizing on this in the most obvious way possible. I mean, there, there shouldn't be, just from the stuff we've covered in the last 10 minutes, there shouldn't be any doubt in people's minds. Why is it still so hard for Action SA, the DA, uh, IFP, even Bantu Olomisa. Why is it so hard for them to convince people to vote for them? So the DA is at 22, 23% today. And probably in my guess, in the national election, if they keep going, will be 20 to 25%. Okay. Mm -hmm. ANC will be at 40% or below national vote. And then we've got the other smaller parties. Now, there are a lot of egos there, okay? Yeah. A lot yeah, of egos. There. You know, I think Herman's a fantastic guy. But, <laughs> but Action SA needs to be more than Herman. We need to see a deeper bench of people. <laughs> <laughs> You're laughing, and I want to ask you why. I know Herman is a fantastic guy, but I also think, you know, that there, there is now a build-up, and it's it's one of the points that you make in your video, in, in your um, talk as well, that there should be, we, we should all be working towards getting a coalition government. It's the only way that we can deal with the ANC, and I absolutely disagree with that. I think Nelson Mandela Bay is one example that will show you what a should show a coalition of the opposition parties that we have in this country is. Mm. Tswane is another one. We're sitting now here in Johannesburg with the, the DA running the coalition and failing to wrangle that coalition. The, the truth of the matter is that, and we do get the government that we... Um, we do get the government that we deserve because we as individuals are quite happy to relegate all this power to absolutely useless people in every single one of these parties instead of yeah, being part of true. the solution. And, and Rob, the best people are never going to be in politics because politics is a mugs game and, and it's there's no qualification for that. Oh. You, don't have to, you don't have to know how to do public administration to be voted in. It's just a popularity contest. Hold on. Hold on a second. Let's hypothetically say, right, that the DA get 25%, Action SA get 15%, and then VF Plus and Carter, COPE, AC, DF, and PA bring, in us, bring us up to 55%, 57%, and that's the coalition. 
let's hypothetically assume that's the case, yeah? And it's not impossible. We're trending towards that, okay? Think of the incredible people we could put on our cabinets that come from those parties or from civil society or from business. Imagine putting Mark Barnes in charge of, you know, SOEs. He knows exactly how to deal with it. You know, there's some yeah, he couldn't deal with it at, and couldn't deal with it at the post office, but he no, knows how to do with it. But he knows how to do it now. He knows how to do it now. But, but I've got great people across the line. Rappelling in as head of uh, education. I mean, South Africa has a has a deep bench of extraordinary people. And if we brought those people in in each ministry, compare them to the idiots we've got today, the country will I, take off like a rocket, like a rocket. But why must we believe you? You know, why must we believe you who starts out by saying, you know, Cyril Ramaphosa used to be a great guy. We should. And that's why we had Ramaphoria is everybody was like, Cyril Ramaphosa knows how this thing is going to happen. Let's give him a chance. Let's Cyril Ramaphosa. I didn't say he was a great guy ever. I did say he was a better option than Zuma. And we've and I've been proven wrong. And Puma, you've been proven that's right. Worse, He's pathetic. Yeah. He's a disaster. <clears throat> okay, but so. Here's, here's a question for both of you, and let's, let's be pragmatic for a second. <laughs> we have a massive public wage bill, okay? So this is never, never going to go away. No matter what government comes in, no one will win in this country if they come in with the, the idea that we're going to slice that public wage bill down to where it should be. Because the public sector unions and pretty much every family that has a public servant in it has benefited enormously from this, you know, year by year, unquestioned increase, uh, salaries that, that are higher than the average salary comparison in the private sector. Surely this is something we need to address because that is where a lot of our money is going. Who's going to have the balls? Who's going to have the, the temerity or the stupidity to suggest, oh, we're going to slice the public wage bill in half? Because it's just not going to get, it's, it makes you unelectable in this country. I will do it. And that's the first thing I'll do. If you, at the moment, we have population growth exceeding economic growth, which means every single year we get poorer. Okay. Mm -hmm. What everyone's forgetting is they're all looking at, oh, we mustn't cut costs. We mustn't cut costs. We're too scared. That's the first thing you do. You slice, you slice out half of the people in government. You reduce the number of cabinet ministries to 20 from 27 right and you cut massively what happens at the same time which everybody forgets is economic growth takes off like a rocket there's billions and billions of dollars waiting to come into this country the minute somebody says i'm cutting cost deregulating and making the environment friendlier to investors we will get economic growth of five to ten percent for 10 years running we'll be the fastest growing country in africa Overnight. And that economic growth provides us the money for the country to replace these idiots in government with very good and competent people and new businesses and funding existing businesses. There is money coming it's, into this country. So it's, it's not, oh. you know, there is money coming into this country. Okay. Foreign direct investment in the past quarter has grown. In 2022, oh, sure. we have yeah. more foreign direct investment than the UK. Let me just look it up no, no, here. No, no, so no, no. Pumi, you got your numbers completely wrong. Our foreign direct investment is 5% of what it should be. Most foreigners are just going, this country is a bunch of idiots. We're not investing. Who, You're wrong. Who's there, investing? Like, I'm interested in that. Like, who would, who would be putting money into this country right now besides, like, China? There's no one. I mean... It, it, the amount of money that would come here, and to Zimbabwe for that matter, if we got re replaced these idiots in government with decent... So here's the Finch. Enormous. Guys, can I just say, so here's Fitch's report of the past quarter here in South Africa, right, where the foreign direct investment here in South Africa in Finch has grown by almost 22 billion US dollars. Fitch. This is not South African Treasury telling us this. This is not a number being made up by some minister. That's what Pretty. they are telling us is what it looks Pretty. like. Tell me that report and tell me from what base it, it came from. What was it last year? What is it this year? 
It's and it is based on year on year. It is based on year on year. Twenty two percent. Put the report up here. Put it up on screen. Oh, I can't put uh, it up on screen. I'm going to send it to you now. Send it to me. Send it to me. I'll share it. Sure. Sure. Rob, yeah. You're Listen, wrong. I, I don't want to. I don't want to argue the, argue about this. But, but Rob, to go back to what you said just now about the public wage bill, um, you said I will do it. Is this an overt pitch no. into the political world? Because, like you know, Pumi Pumi always no, says. No, no. no, but I mean, this is the thing: is uh, you know, people have to have to put their their balls on the line here, and 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 Pumi always says the only person who's going to make a change in the in the community is you and people have to stand in their individual wards and you know independent candidates will be a better bet for us i think going forward than the than the political parties because the political parties have really let us down and also we don't have a constituency based system where the people who are who are in parliament are people who are elected from communities around south africa we've got party list systems and there's there's a lot of complication around that and it's maybe not the best system we don't know whether the constituency thing would work better, but Pumi always says it's up to each of us individually in our own environment to make a difference. If you're saying you would be the guy who would be bold enough to cut the public wage bill, does this mean you're going into politics? No, definitely not. The last thing I would do is politics. I have very low respect for politicians and regulators and lawyers. And I've always said anyone who studies political science at university is just wasting their time and wasting mm -hmm. our time. So I, I, I have zero respect. I also, I've reached a point in my age where I can't sit in meetings and listen to people talk crap for half an hour or state the obvious, which is all they do. You need people that are in there, that know what they're doing, that are decisive and are elected by our population. I'm not standing for politics. I'm happier where I am, being um, whatever, a maverick or whatever I am. I'm not. The number you quoted was in South African rand billion, which, if you translate into dollars, is basically very, very little. So, sorry, just to. All right. Okay. So, so guys, how about this? How about this then? Um, someone says here, what do we do about ESCOM? Um, and and both of you can have a go at this because this is the this is the central issue in our economy at the moment. Everything is dependent on us being able to supply reliable electricity. Otherwise, everybody from the, 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 the little caravan that makes Borovos rolls and Mohodu to, you know, the big corporate office building in Santon that has 10,000 employees. Everyone is affected by this thing. It's what do easy. we do there? It's so easy. Let private sector invest. Let us, broad private sector, invest Take the risk in any – you can invest in coal-fired plants, in my view. You could do nuclear. You can do gas, fracking. We've got tons of shale gas under the Karoo. Mm. And renewable energy, why not? Keep going. But we need baseload power. Let the private sector solve the problem. We can do it in two seconds. But that muffin head, Gwede Mantashe, who's, mm. I don't know, 70 years old and a communist – I mean, how dumb do you have to be to be a communist in these days – Calls for ESCOM 2.0. They couldn't run ESCOM 1.0. So the private sector can solve this overnight. Just deregulate and let us get going. And write off ESCOM, which is basically run by the mafia anyway. So easy. Well, um, we One heard lot. some disturbing. There's some disturbing. Joel Ramaphosa cuts his trip overseas short to come back and help on ESCOM. I mean, he creates the problem. How does he come back to help ESCOM? What is he going to plug in the toaster? He has no idea what he's doing. Okay, but we hear these these reports of like how so much of what's going on in ESCOM at no. the moment is, is sabotage. Do you do you believe in that? I mean, Pums, yes. what are you, what are your thoughts on this too? Because if ESCOM is to be saved, I mean, we don't have a criminal justice system that's worth talking about, and, and God alone knows how many times the name Shamila Batoy has come up on this show. But we have not prosecuted anybody. I mean, if, if there's been anyone, it's like a sprinkling of herbs on the top of a soup that we've actually managed to get anyone into court, certainly not convicted. I mean, there are no people in prison uniforms at the moment who should be. This is where a lot of the trouble comes from. So if there is sabotage in ESCOM, these people are getting away with it because there's no one who's going to come and get them. There's no one who's going to come and arrest them. Yeah. Can I go, Pumi? Yeah. 
So Dayton McKenzie has offered himself to be head of ESCOM. Why has he done it? Dayton has dealt with mafia and gangsters in his life. He spent 10 years in jail as a bank robber. He served his time. He was released on good behavior. And he has, he has found redemption. Put him in as head of ESCOM. He knows how to deal with mafia. He's not afraid. How can a white guy go and then sort out mafia? You need someone who knows what gangs, how gangsters, how badly they behave. Put him as head of ESCOM and he will sort out the mafia. But, it, but I'll give you one little example. There's the cable mafia, there's the coal mafia, and there's the diesel mafia. Every time ESCOM kicks in load shedding, the demand for diesel goes through the roof. Find out who owns and controls the import of diesel, and you'll find out who benefits from load shedding. There's a mafia. What do you say, Pums? We don't need a mafia to solve ESCOM. We need engineers. <laughs> like, we don't need a mafia to solve ESCOM. We need engineers. And the reality yeah. is that we, between the board and the executives and the, and wow, it was one of the things that I did want to talk about today is, and the people that are supposedly that get kind of relegated as these are the good guys. Where the hell is Pravin Gordon? Right. Oh, yes. This is yeah. this is what we need is we need people who know how to kick the tires in that build, in that business, kicking the tires in that business. Right. I think that what we very good at as South Africans, and again, it's something we spoke about earlier in the show, is we we've we're very good at being grumpy and angry and talking out loud. And when the time comes to act, where you have to do something, you stand up and be part of the solution. We don't want to do that, right? We don't want to take the risk of putting our money in, we don't want to take the risk of putting our money in the political parties that we believe in. We don't want to take the risk of putting our skills in the places that they need to be in. We're, we'd much rather just get an inverter, <laughs> get a solar yeah. panel. Get uh, just on, on that you know, note, um, of the system. On that note, I heard about a list, which I'm sure is now, I mean, it's in the news, so it's not something that only I know about, but Solidarity, the, the union, gave 300 names of old engineers who used to work for ESCOM to, uh, to the government and said, here, here, are, here are 300 people that you can employ now. They will be willing to come and work at ESCOM and help fix the problems. Here they are. You know how many they took? Something like 15 or 18 of them is the, the number that they took. Now, I mean, that's solidarity saying, here, here's a solution. We're going to give you actual names of actual people. We've gone and researched. We've gone through our, our membership. We found you people who can help you sort this out. And government's determination, their, their actual will to change anything amounted to what 15 to 18 people who of course are just like again it's it's showing it's like you know here's some performance stuff it's not really so going to say where are the engineers they'll fix it the government won't let us put the engineers back into escom it's the government hmm. it's and you're right where's Pravin gordon he is pathetic yeah. beyond belief i mean he was in charge of the soes i read an article today they're going to write off saa if this new deal doesn't go through Write it off. Write off ESCOM. Let's, by the way, look at the airlines today. You have Fly Air, Airlink, and Semair. They fill the gap quite happily and they're operating quite effectively. You don't need SAA anymore. And SAA wasn't an airline, it was just an employment agency for the ANC and a way for them to steal money, like all the other SOEs. Get rid of them, privatize them, sell the SOEs, let the private sector back to save South Africa. Well, um, okay, so we got we got the parastatal. I'm, I completely agree with you too. You know how I feel about Pravin Gordon, Pumi. I mean, I think that that guy has managed to skate through, and he's managed to maintain this this bizarre um, like reputation, even in the media, of being one of the fix it guys when he has been part of the problem from day one. And I said on the show on yesterday morning, I think it was, that Cyril too has has got this this veneer of like respectability and it's largely not thanks to long. the media i have to say not it's the media long. well i mean listen he's still 
know, people always go, well, better Cyril than Didi Mabuza. That's what people say. So he manages to skate through just like Praveen Gordon. But it is amazing to me how many people have been in government for 22 years and have done nothing good and yet maintain their job in government. If you were in a business that Pumi runs or that Rob Hersov runs and you did a bad job for even a month, I don't think you'd last very long. These guys have done 20 something years and they still maintain their positions and their respectability and their titles and their blue light brigades. So I think uh, one of the things that we as South Africans, all South Africans need, including yourself, Rob, is to be brave enough to understand that what we are looking at right now is not where the solution is. To be brave enough to take a different stance that says maybe our answer is not in the IFP or the EFF or the PA or the maybe our answer is in a completely new and different way of organizing our politics and who those people are and not be scared into thinking that a new person, a new party, a new perspective is what is going to change this country. I don't think that a coalition of the inept is going to do it. But Pumi, you're saying this and you're not giving us the answer, which is what everyone else is doing. I'm sorry to criticize you, but it's, you know, you're being the I'm critic and not the, man that, and not the man in the arena. So maybe let me give you an idea. We have an election in 2024, whether we like it or not. We've got to get everyone to try and get everyone out to vote. We've got to get the ANC out and we've got to vote for change, okay? We, ha we have no option. We have to do that. But maybe what you're talking about is a whole new world. And I am building that. There's a thing called a DAO, a Decentralized Autonomous Organization based on blockchain. There's a whole new currency in cryptocurrency being developed. And there's an NFT, which is a digital certificate of ownership. Okay, now I'm not sure anyone's following me, but I hope you are. But all three of these things are based on the blockchain technology, which is going to change our world. What if we founded a new South Africa on the blockchain based on 15 principles, which I've written, done, they're ready to go, and you signed up for it. And let's say we got... 65% of the voting population to join this new country. And we just issued our own visas, issued our own passports, issued our own currency, and we just ignore this bunch of morons in government and got on with building a proper, decent society where we pay the goodness forward, look after each other, look after the people that need help, and do the right thing. It's a so whole you are going into politics and you are no. the president of this hypothetical new world. In the metaverse, <laughs> yes. I'll have an avatar. Maybe I'm called the chief, which is my nickname. <laughs> but I mean, Pumi, you haven't given us a solution. You've criticized but not given a solution. I'm trying to give a solution. Sorry to put you on the spot. No, it is. You, you're definitely not putting me on the spot. And I have said all year this year that there is a size big shift coming in politics in South Africa in the next 20 months. And when it does, and which is what I have always been a proponent of is we as South Africans have to be brave. We have to be brave and we have to see it differently from what it is there. It is not going to come from the past. And we're not going to get to talk about it today, but you know, Gareth, I never, I don't know if you got an invite from your friend uh, Mututi, was it? from mm -hmm. One South Africa, but I certainly didn't get an invite to Musi Maimane's new party launch that's happening this Saturday. Uh, we have... Yeah, they wouldn't, they wouldn't have invited me. You, you, know, you know how, uh, how well they... Uh, you know, I get along with Musi like oil and water. We, we have fascinating moves happening in the political arena in this country with a lot of interesting people putting together fascinating new ways. And my only... As a, as a broadcaster, my only call is to say and encourage all South Africans to be a little bit brave and take a leap into well, something new and different. I'm up for it. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to give Rob the last word on this because he's our guest this morning. But I think, I think, Pumi, what I like about both of you is that you both are brave and you both have put your money where your mouth is. 
Um, and, and you have gone and you've created a, a, a business and you've, and Rob, you've, you've really spent a lot of time thinking about this stuff. You've stuck your neck out, which in this country can have enormous costs. For me, I know you've done the same. You do it every week on this show. You are brave people. But again, I mean, the passion that, that either of you seems to, um, to have inside of you doesn't always integrate perfectly. And this, this kind of goes to your point, Pumi, about how coalitions might not work out as well as we hope they will. Because there are egos, there are different points of view. Brave people, and there are a lot of brave people in this country, um, unfortunately not enough of them in politics, but there are brave people in this country. The problem is they don't always agree. And that's evidenced by what you two are saying this morning. I mean, you both are brave people, but you don't agree on everything. So this is what happens is you end up in a, in a bit of a stalemate some of the time. This is politics is why you two aren't in politics. And if you were, you'd be butting heads 24 seven, right? Seems obvious to me. All right, Rob, you get the last word. What, what do you want to tell people? What do you want to say to ordinary South Africans about what the future holds? A lot of people very depressed at the moment. Pumi and I started this show this morning talking about this happiness index that UJ has just put out about how people are grumpier and more despondent than they've ever been. What would you like to say to South Africans? You're a positive guy. Give us some of your insight. Tell us why we should still believe in this place. South Africa will take off like a rocket with foreign direct investment, with internal investment, with incredible human capital that exists in this country. If we get rid of the ANC, if people who didn't vote register and vote and vote for change, that's all I'm saying. Vote for change. Get these guys out. And whether Pumi likes it or not, a messy coalition is going to be a hundred times better than these idiots running the country right now. Okay. There's some stuff to think about. Uh, Rob, I knew you would set fire to the comments section, which you have done. Um, I knew that you and Pumi would have some serious uh, disagreements, which you have both had. And I'm delighted to have uh, hosted you both on the show this morning. Pums, you've got another week next week to say your say, and I'm sure you will. And we'll have more guests for us to disagree with and some to agree with. But Rob, it's and always good to have you on. sharing notes about the event on Saturday because we mm. weren't invited. Yeah. Well, I don't want to be invited to uh, anything Musi does. I don't really believe in him. Uh, Rob, thanks so much, man. Nice to have you on. And uh, bring us some of the elect electricity from Singapore, if you don't mind. Just put it in your bag on the way. Everything works well here. <laughs> Damn right it does. But don't say that like Helen Zilla did or you'll be in trouble. All right. Cheers. There's Rob Hersov, everybody. Always good to have him on. And, um, you know, again, like half the comments agree with him. Half the comments do not. But at least people are thinking. And we, we're all in this boat. We've got to make it sail. We can't make it sink. Good stuff. Realistic and not grumpy. Yeah, let's be realistic, not grumpy. I like it. Pumi Mashiko, we will see you next week. Thank you for putting up with my grumpiness last week. I, uh, in, I, will, endeavor to be, I will endeavor to be better this week. And we will see everybody tomorrow, 6 a.m. bright and early. Have an excellent day, everybody. Cheers. Bye-bye.